Right, okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Crafty Crows, our fabulous September edition. And tonight we've got open mic, and we also have our guest poet, Ivor Daniel, and headliner, Bill Lewis. Um, uh, before we kick off tonight, um, there's a few housekeeping rules. Uh, one is the most uh, important, is the really, most, uh, important, really, is to uh, remember to mute when each poet reads as a matter of courtesy so we can all clearly hear what they're saying as well. Um, you will have the opportunity to unmute after each open mic performance and each guest poet and headliner performance as well to show your appreciation. Um, the next item is that each edition of Crafty Crows is put onto our YouTube channel. And so all work there is classed as being published. So that's something to consider when you're sharing work. So some magazines and competitions won't accept it. Um, and a copy of the chat transcript for this evening and the audio recording will be made available on the Gloucestershire Poetry Society website, which is www.thegloucestershirepoetrysociety.co.uk. Right, so before we go into our first open mic, I will kick off with one of my poems. And that is called Kitchen Break, and it was published in the Blue Nib way back before the pandemic hit us uh, in the Blue Nib issue 37, and it's called Kitchen Break. The kitchen door burst open as a raging bull grunted and stamped with discontent. He ranted white noise that fell on deaf ears as she played her favourite song on repeat in her head. She didn't want or need to understand him. Rasps, grinds and shrieks tried to pierce her bubble, but they may as well have been wet peas squashing in a sink. His breath erupted like a boiling kettle, burning, quaking, spewing foul gases into the room. The hissing vapour transformed into butterflies in the mists of her daydream of happier times, and she sighed the last breath of summer. His fiery autumn words fell like dead leaves onto the cold, tiled floor, as he realised a lonely time lay ahead. He knew that she was free of him, as he watched her stir grains of frost into a mug. The ring of the spoon against its walls sounded the last chime of their journey together. He left the room, crumpling a snowdrift carpet in the hallway, as he picked up his clinking chained keys and walked through the front door. It slammed shut with a giant thump, like the close of a stone coffin lid in a crypt. But she didn't notice a thing. He was just a ghost of winter's past, silently fading away as her lips touched warm chocolate froth and all was good in the world. OK, thank That's you. Fun. So we'll go straight into our open mic list. And uh, Michael, if you're ready. Michael Sender, everybody. Sure, thanks. Great to be here. Thought I'd just go ahead and uh, do a couple of fairly short ones. And uh, this first one is the one that I have in the uh, new uh, Beat Poet anthology. It's called Holes in Space. Sweet child. As you look back in time to see the holes in space where friends and family should be, short lives that should have left longer shadows across experience, kisses, hugs, and lessons never shared. Know that they would now embrace you in communion transcending span of days. These holes you see still let in light pattern woven round them, stitches all to all, echoes flowering song, exhale sweet scent from memory and momentum. They are you and you contain in you at least a part of them. Those known to you or lost before your arrival. These holes may tunnel down to grief, but they fill with wonder. Oh child, dear child, do not fear to peer deep and discover marvelous tales that mirror your new trail. Living loved ones may falter, falling into mourning, 
dipping arms into openings, attempting to pull last treasures from well of tears. Hold them tight. Do not allow them to fall in and be lost. An occasional drink of salt water passing lips will wake tired taste buds and summon recollection of shared feasts, but these waters of grief do not bubble up to be bathed in. Sweet little one, we wish as all who have lost will always wish. You could have known or heard the singular spirit encased in each. Lost opportunity deprives us of the sweet and the tender, the hilarious and melancholy character each snuffed candle's once dancing flame contained. Look into the eyes of the living behind puddling saline falls. That candlelight still flickers undimmed. Let them kindle and pass on the incandescence. Let the light that emanates from these holes in space that mark your past, that invisibly led to you now, stay strong. Sweet, dear, gentle child. Be all the sum their lost promise allows, for you have life, and that is what their paid price bought, and you are worth it all. And I'm going to do one more little short one, and fairly short, and it's sort of touches a little bit of the same themes. It's called Archipelago. I am from a broken chain on a locked gate, frozen, cracked, flaked with rust, crumbling, falling moats indistinguishable from dirt, inseparable from spirit minute skeleton keys to memory. I am from an archipelago of souls whose links fell into the sea. Those who can never know home, can never look back, never dock in ports where tattered canvas portraits flutter and reach towards their truth on a ship that is sailed. I am from those whose history was burnt to ash, absent voices that neither sing nor shout, Bones piled in heaps reveal no secrets, can never speak, can never sleep. I am from surprised sailors who set sail before the last gleam of day winked out on the forsaken shore, blown by the wind of things to come, west towards hope. I am from dank tenements filled with rag pickers, fruit merchants, corner side vendors, and sweatshop tailors choked by coal dust laid over blocks, a settled coat blown up from rutted streets, echoing clacking carts, cobbling a close-knit woven community full of song, needled with embroidered hope stitched onto tradition. I am from a broken chain on a locked gate of a fallen wall, flattened in a storm called progress. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Michael. We can all unmute and show appreciation. That's great, thank you. Okay, uh, before we go on to the next open mic, um, we do have open mic slots available. So if you would like to read tonight, uh, please pop a message in the chat for me. Okay, and we can add you to the list. Um, next up is uh, Neymar, please. And who says me? Yes, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, gosh. Okay, um, yeah, I'll read uh, um, a couple of poems. First one is called um, Portobello Market. Portobello Road, purged of people, a solitary stall here and there, whose coffers are bare, a call from the steeple, absent lay people, secondhand lives on display, autobiographical archipelagos, awash with the secrets they enclose, their fading facades ebbing away. The gold-born boys caterwauling, a scant selection of fruit and veg, the fumbling fiasco they sketch, Brexit and COVID grimly galling, empty roads that recollect the sacred Sundays of infancy, the faithful contingency in the pews as God rests, Masked shadows on the periphery, oh. 
the infidel delegation scorning the salvation of God's revelation, lost and awaiting a Damascus epiphany, a market without the masses, a swan song in the void of nature destroyed, of avarice employed as the rich raise their glasses. Thank you. And my second poem is, um, I'm not sure how familiar um, our American friends are with the um, tragedy that happened at Grenfell Tower. Um, I actually lived just very close to Grenfell Tower for many years and this poem was inspired by that event. The Hood in Notting Hill. In June's blooming in thrall, where advancement has stalled, funding has been cut, the youth clubs are shut, the citadel ablaze with money saved, warnings in the ash, pulling against the tide of statistical projection, genteel gentrification, a hotbed of crime, here's a dime, call someone who cares, switchboards drowning in calls, the ghettoized poor, if you can't run crawl, never mind where you start, 800k before a fall, charred bricks and green hearts, the neglected track holding you back, don't fall through the cracks as you salute those who broke through, paying tribute to the faces we knew, choking in the stairwell in Grenfell as the suits dodged the fall. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naima, for sharing tonight. That's great. Thank you. If you can all unmute and show your appreciation, please. Thank you. OK, so following on from that, we have uh, Paul. Paul Truon, please. Good evening. So I'm going to read you a poem. So I'm going to read the first one I'll read you. It's called Entitled Tomes. It's about um, a lady I met a couple of summers ago um, in St. Moore's in Cornwall. So Tomes. I met her on the seawall one hot August evening, drinking cheap Chardonnay from a plastic beaker. I'd been warned about the psychotic episodes, the blood on the walls, the stained bed, her record. A friend of a friend, she'd had a few. Slurring her words, she opened up like a can of beans, spilling her truth the way only the inebriated can, the drink, the drugs, the crappy rehab, the frail relationships, the beatings, the orthorectomy, the drowning. She told me about the cruise ship and singing on stage and losing her nerve. Then she sang and the tide stopped turning and the goals landed. A voice like Holiday and those mythical mermaids who haunt the shores. Her melancholic tones reaching across the harbour touching the tourists, unloading from the ferry, stretching in land to the patrons, sat at tables, no longer sipping their drinks. Then it was me and her and the lighthouse in the distance. The white beacon seen in tunnel vision. And in those words, I could feel her every pain, her every joy, her every hope. Do I have, do I have time for one more? Uh, this one is entitled Loopy Lou of St. Also, it's another person I met in, Saint, in um, Cornwall. She um, lived in a place called St. Austell, but the locals call it St. Ozzel. So this is Loopy Lou. Loopy Lou of St. Ozzel. I remember her like a mythical creature, hobbling along, clutching three litres of cider, absorbing the abuse, the abuse, spitting at anyone who got near. They say she had hepatitis, that she was dying, that it was infectious with large rimmed glasses and granny headscarf covering grey straw-like hair falling over her face, wrinkled beyond her years, she sipped and drooled and slept wherever she fell. A scraggly frame hunched with bony arms cradling, cradling her white lightning like a baby. The last time I saw her, I was sat on the bus and she sat rocking in the shelter. She looked into my eyes and I into hers and I saw her whole life, the sadness, the despair, the loss. I raised my hand and opened my fingers half waving and gave a small pitying smile as the bus pulled away. I swear I saw a faint flicker and the corner of her mouth twitch fleetingly then disappear 
like a cloud covering a full moon, leaving only darkness and a few faint stars flickering way off in the distance. That's great. Thank you, Paul, for coming on tonight. Thank you. Round of applause, everybody. Paul, thank you. OK, moving on next on the list. Gerald, are you ready? Hi, everyone. Um, that discussion earlier uh, that you were having, Leslie was introducing, reminded me of a poem that started with something that my dad talked about, and it's called Sex. During a card game at my grandfather's, someone mentioned the word sex. There was a silence as my father recalls the story. It was like the pulling out of teeth, which my grandfather also did in an amateur kind of way, as grandmother roamed around Belfast telling my dad that children's were what hell was like. Sex, my grandfather finally said. Now that's a word I never use, never have cause to. Once on a train, my wife and I were sitting opposite in a carriage, a woman on the third arm of the table, prim of the bedstead, struck up a conversation about the weather and holidays and children and the things that matter to strangers on train, trains. After a minute being bored, I took out the paperback I was reading. Is sex necessary? It's the first outing by James Thurber and starts with the words, during the past years, two factors in our civilization have been greatly overemphasized. One is aviation, the other is sex. The woman saw the cover. She didn't speak for the rest of the journey. Of course, we all know that sex began in 63 between the Chatterley case and the Beatles' first LP. But most people don't know that shag is much older. I came across it in a dictionary of swear words, which Jane Austen might have read. Shag, says the lexicon balatronium, is to copulate. A blunt, specific and scientific definition avoids any suggestion of embellishment or fun, gets to the bones of the act, or in the case of Ruskin, famously doesn't. But perhaps 63 is right, because I remember watching Puppet on a String and being overcome by the appearance of female breasts on the big screen. A camera shot only amplified in the remembering. Such sights are now so commonplace, we can hardly imagine that sex was once like that. Up on the top shelf, behind a paper cover, Something done in Amsterdam by rock stars with a carry-on commentary or adopting James Bond condescension. Now, sex is everywhere like a rash of Tracy Emin's beds, which have spilled out from Margate into everyone's imagination. My father, when he visited the now famous art piece, commented afterwards that it lacked the smell but then he claimed to have swung naked under the Mourne Mountains and that people came out in boats from Newcastle County down to see the spectacle. There is, you see, something slightly appealing to me about a, a world where sex isn't everything and proving you've just had it or will have it shortly or are very good at it is not a social requirement, where you don't have to be ambidextrous imaginative, a full-on cognoscenti. Don't get me wrong, when I look back at Peter and Pamela grow up, which was still on my parents' bookshelves when they died, I'm glad we've moved forward from those tentative steps by H.W. Tame to educate honestly. I'm glad we teach all kinds of relationships to children that we no longer penalize people for their deepest affections if they do not fit in with ours. It's just, I sometimes feel I'm drowning in it. This corporate, collective, in your face promotion of sex. 
I want to say something radical and I want to say it now. Some days, to be honest, I'd rather not be bothered. Some days I'm not interested. Some days I just want to get on with my life, eat toad in the hole, climb mountains, sleep. If that's old fashioned, so be it. No doubt my grandfather had a royal flush in his hands sometimes, even if he couldn't admit it. But how my father came into being, no, that's a mystery I'll probably never uncover. I suspect a stalk was involved. Thank you very much. Uh, I really like that. Thank you so much, Gerald. Thanks Wonderful for last voice. line, Gerald. Yes. <laughs> applause for Gerald. Thank you. It's absolutely true. He did tell me that story. It's absolutely he told me. And the one about the Mormon, that, that all things my dad told me. It's probably live, but there you go. Oh, wonderful. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you. And um, right, okay. And um, Carlos, the unhappy, would you like to go next? Wow, that wasn't expecting that. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm going to read one. I think some of you might have heard it before, but um, it's um, now a poem more dear to my heart than it was when I finally finished it. And it's because it's just been accepted and appears now in International Times in It, uh, which everyone will know is the probably the greatest countercultural magazine there ever was alongside Oz. And also, um, it made me dig out my copy of um, uh, uh, Whale Nation, which was probably the first book, as you can see that there, first book of poetry I ever, ever bought when I was uh, in the Whale and Dolphin Conservation Society. But Heathcote Williams was the editor at International Times when it went online. Um, and recently, I saw in the Stroud Bookshop, I think it is, Jason, copy of yeah. B, which is a pamphlet by Heathcote Williams, uh, which you can still get, um, which is great that that's been republished. Of course, uh, he died in 2017. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, International Times is fantastic. Um, it, it's one of those things that seems like a pinnacle of achievement to, to someone like myself, not least because uh, Mick Farron used to be the editor and he was the great frontman of the Deviants, if you remember them. Anyway, I'm going to read Universe Reaching Out, which is the poem that was published. So please uh, forgive me this indulgence. And it goes like this. Sitting in school, watching the breeze move along the bushes. I see it, the universe reaching out. Reaching out as if one of those uncanny days when the sun and moon occupy the same sky or the silent red evening when swallowed scythe to feel the breeze in the cutting of the air. Unseen, she drops tender light inside a raindrop. Spectrum trapped, a world sliding down purple bell of foxglove. I see her song of moments in memories too. The pale young lady wrists of my grandmother peeling potatoes in cool sink water. Oh, sweet universe, you spread across the long dawn of forever as thin waves of creation have become in us a child helping his father read. Guerrilla poets dropping free verse at graffiti bus stops in the rain. Even an old lady up late in moonlit room, writing to Israel for the Palestinians. The leap of the whale, fall of a star, ghost of Segovia singing through a guitar. Explosion of gloom, the multitude of green, these songs sing wherein universe declares herself, does so each night under eyes that are closed, gifts us the innate meditate. We sleep illuminated in the black, in the space between the stars, breathe soft without knowing, as she breathes through us with graceful touch, her waves of nothing. Empties waiting minds that practice the endless from whence we came and go, so that we might ourselves dream instead, perhaps hymns of moment such as these. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, for sharing that. Thank you. Round of applause, everybody, for that. That's great. 
Right, we've got a few minutes less, so I'm going to throw in uh, another one, if you forgive me, um, before we go to our guest poet, um, Iva Daniels, um, before the break. Um, this one is called Sandpaper Summits, and it was published in the Poetry Bus PB8, and as a trigger warning um, for self-harm in this, so just give you some pre-warning for that. It's called Sandpaper Summits. Auburn scars, tattooed for sharp distraction, block memory with a warm rush of welcomed pain. Lipstick and gloss hide sorely bitten lips, cut with worry and the fear of upsetting fruit cards. An invisible summit is torn through self-preservation in the pursuit of a blissful escape. Crawling fingers struggle to seek purchase on a puckered surface, searching for a blooded grip. Jagged, bitten nails burrow to sump skin, scratching sandpaper raw in pursuit of clarity. Constellations of dry Merlot clots leave a taut stress map of teardrop stars. Battle marks from a contoured life camouflaged by cloth and foundation through changing landscapes. Thank you. So with no further ado, we will um, go on to our first feature this evening, Iva Daniel, and uh, here is Iva's bio. Iva's poems have appeared in A Spray of Hope, Wildfire Words, Steel Jack Door, Writer Esque, I Am Wave Seven, Fevers of the Mind, The Trawler 2021, Roy Faineant, Ice Flow Press, The Dawn Treader, After, Alien Buddha, Block Party, Black Knoll Review, Orchard Lee Anthology, and Crump's Barn Anthology. Um, so if you'd like to show yourselves with a big round of applause for Ivor, please, Ivor Daniel. All right, good to see you folks. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, the poems I'm going to read uh, tonight it first appeared in um, these publications, Fevers of the Mind, Block Party, A Spray of Hope, Eyes Flow Press, The Dawn Treader, and I Am. So thank you all to, thank you to all those presses and uh, I'd like to thank Cheltenham Poetry Festival and Gloucestershire Poetry Society who kept this all going during the lockdown years. It felt like years anyway. And this first poem is called In High Summer. In high summer, when flies walk upon my forearm hairs, proprietorial as landlords, and the land is ripe with roadkill. Extreme weather scenarios play out in real time. Climate diplomats gather, the plenary is beached. Delegates cloyed as wasps in Cooley. We sit around the water table with an ashen thirst. Everybody wants to make a move, but no one does. Like watching the bleaching of coral. The only thing agreed upon is that all this is unprecedented. Unprecedented rainfall here. Unprecedented temperatures there. Unprecedented use of the word unprecedented everywhere. In high summer, the deluge, the canicule, the conflagration. Ants grow fat, grow wings, buzz my ears. We pick at the brittle wishbone of consensus. Wait for crows locusts to draw down the dusk with a dry calling. Thank you. These are the Fahrenheit nights and the book that I am reading is burning. All day I cannot speak the same tongue as my body except when immersed in the early sea. 
so thirsty all the time, so salty, going slow as a heat wave slough. I drink red wine from a suffering fridge that complains each time I open it. Now I am the small hours, stupefied, febrile, febrile comme l'insomnie, fever come inside me. And through the apartment wall, someone is snoring, loud as psychotic cicadas in sapped, unsleeping palm trees, these torrid Riviera nights. In the morning, you'll tell me you have hardly slept, although in bed, I listen to your even breath all night, it seems. And then we swim, first thing. Thank you. This next one is um, a lockdown poem, and it's called On a Hierarchy of Vulnerability. Is writing at night easier now the world is global warmed? I come down at 5 a.m. when the birds are claiming the hour, the garden, the woods, the rain, the earth. Let them have it, I think. Perhaps we had our turn. Before that, I had lain in bed, listening to the five live all night phoning, now audibly resembling the Samaritans live on air. That's how much vulnerability is out there. I remember working at the autism school. There was vulnerability in 12 hour shifts for staff and life for the students. I wonder how they are doing now in all this. They were locked down since time. And pondering on, I really should start writing soon. I wonder if there is a hierarchy of vulnerability, an iceberg, an eiger, a Maslow's triangle of pain. I listen to the birds and rain. Thank you. Summer work. Summer work on a trawler out of Conway. Diesel past ripe smells of salt dry lobster pots on harbour walls to the heave of seas. Primary memory, steeled dogfish, bending my teenage forearms back and forth with sandpaper skin. Two hours on duty, two hours off. Around the clock, we left ashore. The butties, the banter. Players number six with PG tips. Sea dog tales of marriages resumed on each return to shore. The earth still moving like the sea. Thank you. This one's for my mum, and it's, and it's called Choose Your Own Mother. I've heard it said the yet unborn can choose their parents. A strange idea, this, although we live in times when nothing is beyond belief. If it is true, if it is true, I ask myself the reason I chose you. Indecisive as I am, and dare say was before my birth, there is one scenario in which I am at peace, wherein, unborn, I somehow hear your singing voice, and from that time, I have no choice. Thank you. This one's called Here, H-E-R-E. -E. Tall grasses alive with the piping of meadow pipits. Fuzzed hum of bees from clover to clover. Two semi-feral horses on the brow of May Hill. And the promised kiss of summer rain falling far near 
here. And now uh, going a bit wintry with this one. Tread lightly. I navigate the microfathom ocean charts of flat portal ice puddles on a January farm track with their trapped air bubbles, walling patterns, coils, gyres, spirals, curls, trapped otherworldly worlds. Secret as fingerprints, coiled like intestines, mysterious as a fetal scan, marbled as the white fat in Spanish ham. Iced lava lamps, but underfoot. Liquid light shows behind psychedelic bands, but monochrome. The frozen surface flat as frosted glass. The patterns captive, zany. This is the cat ice, so named because it can only bear the weight of a cat. Cold poured, agile. Although I'm yet to meet the cat who would leave the warmth of the hearth to test ice puddles with its paws, or fret on other scientific laws as hydrostatic pressure, capillary action, etc. I make a resolution to tread lightly. <laughs> this last poem uh, comes with a content warning. It contains optimism, and I guess we could all do with a bit of optimism these days. It's called Perfect Bed. I dream I am at Bambom Brothers, Dreamland Funfair Park, with Tracy Emin, hard by Margate Sands. I know I shouldn't drink that vodka on the Helter Skelter. Apart from that, a day as perfect as the Lou Reed song. We kiss with fish and chips lips, join hips, a turn a sunset going down. I guess it is the golden hour. Blair's babes and even some of his men MPs are busy changing a whole heap of things for the better. Back in your room, we remember that. We even changed the bed this morning. The linen, soft and cool, next to our optimistic skin. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ivor, for sharing. That's all on you to show our applause for Ivor set. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks very much, Ivor. Always yeah. enjoy hearing you read. Wonderful. Right, okay, and uh, that's it for the first half. Uh, so what we'll do, we'll have a uh, 10 minute break and we'll pop back at uh, five past eight, if that's okay. And then I'll be handing the baton over to Carlos, the unhappy to host the second half. Um, so um, without further ado, I will stop the recording. Okay. Hi, and welcome back to the second half of Crafty Crows. Um, a little notice first, uh, the next Grafty Crows, the online Zoom, is going to be on Wednesday, the 5th of October, and the guest poets in that episode are going to be Helen Shepherd and our very own Patiba Castle, and that's going to be hosted by Josephine, Josephine Lay, uh, who sends her apologies for tonight, she's just moved, and I don't think they've got a great internet connection yet, um, mm. so she sends her apologies, and obviously so does uh, Peter as well. Um, Okay, I'm going to um, take the opportunity to read another poem. Um, I'm going to try and stay away from the beach stuff since I did that all over the festival on the weekend. And I think some of you have heard this one, but um, since we've got a bit of time, I'm going to do a slightly longer one than normal. Uh, but few of you have heard this before, but it seems to be probably one of my most popular ones. Don't ask me why. Uh, and it's called, Jesus came to me in a dream once. I didn't ask him to. <laughs> Jesus came to me in a dream once. I didn't ask him to. I guess he just does that sort of thing. Came in late night, haze of fag smoke, 1977 lounge, me six, dozing, parents up 1am, drinking and smoking. 
wallpaper white with big green leaves and vine. He steps out from magic forest of white fog into fragile dream assembling like new stars. The dream space of my childhood. Have to go careful there. Home to blue meanies, impossible long division. Diabolical kitty fiddler, Uncle Ernie from Tommy. Scary, colder than cold war, nuclear death in my sleep. But Jesus of the dreams was face of peace, glowed sweet hope. And yet I never really believed. Even back then yawned through hymns in assembly. Shrugged at Bible stories told as communal telling off, building guilt for shit I didn't even do yet. No, never saw the light, but yes, light of the sun turning a field gold, strange light of sunset illuminating the silence of swooping house martins, slow flight of satisfied seagulls of evening by the Y. Dreaming I was an albatross, gliding myself calmly the hell out of here. Dreaming I was lead cat on wall, brimming with courage and knowing. Dreaming, daydreaming, learning to imagine. Imagine light of UFO again, taking me the hell out of here, especially if I remembered I haven't done my homework. Sick of chores, sick of mums, blood spots along the corridor. I can still see what's on TV through the hole in our lounge door. The old man made with his fist, his fists of rage, huge fists, fists that control our house. But imagine, imagine instead tracking the searchlight. Sorry, I'll read that again. But imagine, imagine instead the tracking searchlight when running away, heart racing with glee. Imagine living in Chepstow after hours furniture store with Rastus Mouse from Rupert Bear Annual, leaping on king size beds and best buddy boarding school pillow fights. Imagine all the biscuits in the world are mine. Imagine Jesus of the Fag Hayes wants to help. Imagine he has a plan. Screw you lot, we're going to where the wild things are. Hey, if we're going there, can my friend Pete come too? I feel the empty loneliness of the incredible shrinking man, looking out at the stars of the universe, knowing no matter how small he still exists. Jesus says he's never seen it. What's the use? What's the use when you don't know loneliness? Instead, old man pinches arm to wake me. I'm to clear up as they slope off to bed, empty ashtrays into bin in my imagination, the sad dust of Joan of Arc. Clear glasses, the yawning innkeeper after the last supper. Finally get to bed. Try and ignore the excited wings of the darkling, the dark, dead darkling of the night who waits in the top left-hand corner of my bedroom ceiling, feeds on hope, blows nightmares into my childhood ear with a whisper as six-year-old me slides into sleep, longing for a resurrection that never comes. Thank you. And that's in... Um, Oblivion, 200 Seasons of Pain and Magic. Sorry if you heard that before. Okay, so on to the main event. Um, so yes, welcome to all my C6 sailors, you here tonight and all those in YouTube land. Um, tonight we've got uh, Bill Lewis, um, famous for, I think more than anything, the Stuckist art movement and the Medway poets alongside the likes of Billy Childish and Sexton Ming. Yes some Sexton Ming, just so you know. Um, but um, Bill's here tonight to give us a uh, rip-roaring set, I'm sure, but it's uh, we have to be careful because he warns me that this could be his final collection of poetry that he's working on right now. We hope not, but he's been published since the 1970s. But I found him, I think I saw that Adam Horowitz is in tonight. I can't see him now, but it was uh, his father's uh, grandchildren of Albion where I first read Bill, um, and that was the uh, publication that came out in 1992 as a follow-up to The Children of Albion, came out in 1969. And in this uh, collection, Bill's uh, writing alongside Carol Ann Duffy, John Cooper Clark, Benjamin Zephaniah, Ben Ockrey, and so many more. Um, the uh, collection that I've got that I, I, I love of Bill's is uh, this love like a rage without anger and that collects all the work as you can see from 1975 to 2005 but I think there's a couple of collections after this as well which I've yet to get my hands on. Um, 
but I, in there I can see Bill's uh, um, influences or maybe the touch of, I don't know whether they're intended or not, of Ginsburg a little bit, but also Whitman, but more importantly, the spirit of place, childhood, magic, and even a touch of shamanism in there as well. He was a writer in residence in the 1985 Brighton Festival, and he's performed in Nicaragua, the US, and across Europe. His art, which I do hope you'll also check out from his website, uh, has, has hints of the weird and the mythological, and I think mixed with the bright light colors of Latin America, sort of Sandinista influence, revolutionary colors that to me recall Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, of course. Uh, and I think the poetry also reflects that, that color and that humanity as well. Alan Silito, who you'll probably remember for what is my famous, uh, famous favorite uh, short stories, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, said of Bill, that his work is most impressive. I certainly agree. Um, so please unmute and give a warm welcome to Bill Lewis, please. Hey. hey. Is this a dream I'm dreaming? Is this a dream I'm dreaming? Or am I only dreaming? I am in a dream. Is this a song I'm singing? Is this a song I'm singing? Or am I just a song that is being sung? I'm dancing with the word, the word is like a wife, the word is like a knife, a healing surgeon's knife. Is this a dream I'm dreaming? Is this a dream I'm dreaming? Or am I only dreaming? I am in a dream. Is this a stone I'm skimming? Is this a stone I'm skimming, or am I just a stone skimming on the way? We mentioned childhood there, so I'm going to read a couple of pieces from that rich vein of childhood which we write as love so much. I went to a little village primary school uh, before I came to live in a town. I was a 10 year old Dalek killer. We fought the Daleks on the asphalt of the school playground. We stormed their city every playtime between the climbing frame and the library in late 1963, in those weeks immediately following the assassination of JFK. We fought the evil space aliens almost every day, only ceasing the attack when the teacher rang the bell to call us to our songs. The Beatles sang, Love Me Do. Emma Peel wore a leather cat suit. The world was in black and white and would not be in color till 1969. Our teacher, who had a complete set of Narnia books in the cupboard next to her desk, said we could draw the monster we had watched in last Saturday's episode of Doctor Who. We all drew the same thing. It looked like a giant Venus flytrap, but with tentacles and eyes on stalks. She taped them to the wall at the back of the class, and everyone said mine was best, but I knew that. As at the age of five, I'd already told everyone I would be an artist when I grew up. 40 years later, I watched that episode on VHS and was surprised to see that the creature is never shown. We'd all made identical pictures of something none of us had seen. I was a 10 year old Dalek killer with a man from uncle briefcase complete with code book. I had many notches on my Lone Ranger cap gun and it never ran out of ammo. My assistant is now handing me, <laughs> handing me my next book. Let's see, right. 
Okay. I'll stick with that for the moment. This is called um, My 1960s. Whenever someone mentions Simon Templar's name, a halo would appear above his head. Adam Adamant never got arrested for carrying an offensive weapon, despite walking around London with a sword stick. Captain Scarlet, he's indestructible, but there were always strings attached. Doctor Who was my grandfather and his companions were my true family. I was 10 when I first entered the TARDIS and 15 when I left school in 1968. I couldn't wait to grow up and have adventures in the swinging 60s. One day, I was stacking cans of beans in promotional pyramids at price rights, and it dawned on me, this was the 1970s. I was not an international man of mystery. I would not be asked to a mysterious country house and uncover a plot by enemy agents who had used mind control like John Steed did in an episode of The Avengers. I was a shelf filler without O levels or A levels in a winter of discontent peppered by power cuts. It was the 70s and my 60s were over. Uh, you mentioned Rupert Bear there. So I wasn't going to read this, but I think I should. Rupert, sit down. Your mother and I want to talk to you. Please take your fingers out of your ears. It's not the birds and bees thing again. Look, I'll get right to the point. When you were a little boy on those long school holidays, we loved it when you went out into the forest around Nutwood and had all those imaginary adventures, little men with flying cars, tiger lily, and her dad, the conjurer, and all that sort of thing. We even smiled when you insisted you were a bear and gave your little chums animal names. Although Edward was a bit upset being cast as an elephant, just because his surname happened to be Trump. But now we think you might need some help. Your line manager phoned us. She's worried about some of the things you've been saying at work about mischievous elves putting a spell on the computers. And we think perhaps you should see someone, a professional. Also, there's an issue about those yellow check pants you insist on always wearing. Um, my oldest friend, uh, his parents died um, a little while ago, and I went back to the village I grew up in. And in the eulogy, he told me how his parents met. And this is it. Apple Pickers, 1940. As they work, above them, a spitfire takes on a measure split the daily dogfights of the autumn days of 1940. The spit, like a great broken bird, comes down in the orchard. The wicker baskets fall from their hands, apples bruising on wet grass as they rush to help. They pull the pilot free from the fuselage. He's just 19. At first they think he's wounded, but it's just red hydraulic fluid. Marge is a land girl, and Arthur, a reservist, waiting to be called up. This is how they met. It was a fruit picker's morning, pockets of mist in the valley, the river Medway, a white snake. Stranger in Paradise. I don't believe in heaven as a place, but if it were true, I would have to enter as an illegal immigrant with no documentation and a forged passport. After all, I'd already married an angel, so I should be eligible for a green card. On the test for citizenship, I'd need to pretend that white is my favorite color 
while I plot to paint the celestial city red instead. Biting my tongue as I listen to sermons by sanctimonious saints. But if you were there, as you surely would be, I would grit my teeth and go with the flow while secretly reading banned books at night by flashlight. I worked for a while um, in a hospital. This is called Theatre Story, and it's true. His x-ray showed pieces of a light bulb, glass and filaments, a rusty knife blade, a fork and spoon, a half hunter pocket watch, fob, chain, and several nuts and bolts. In the recovery room, the theater sister looked back and noticed the small oxygen spanner on the, the small spanner on the oxygen cylinder was missing and he was smiling. Now, um, coyote poem, something tricky in the universe, something with pointy ears, something with gray fur, something with a ragged tail, something that steals your chicken, something that hot wires your car. I'm talking Grand Theft Auto. I'm talking Grand Theft Auto. Something that drives a stolen Thunderbird up on the Arizona highways, across the Martian desert and the badlands of New Mexico. Something that runs over a roadrunner. Beep, beep now, you little bastard. The, re the recurring dream of the knife thrower's assistant. The radio plays 13 Mexican angels in the Valley of the Sun, and she is not wearing a blindfold. Her face feels naked, not nude. She's strapped to the spinning target, but, it, but it's his wife and not him whose hands blossom with a bouquet of throwing knives and looking at her with jealous eyes like daggers, she thinks. She feels like wet silk that has been pulled too tight and might rip at any moment as she spins. The sequins of her limbs sparkle. The ruby in her navel feels like a bullseye. She wakes in her caravan and gets dressed in a hurry, packing a bag and departs without leaving a goodbye note. In her next job, she will be an aerialist or be fired from a cannon, something safe. This is called Mint Tea and Kiff. The blind man in the market wears dark glasses and a fez. He sings and accompanies his voice with a fiddle. He only knows one song is about a lost or possibly stolen passport. Some people just pay him to go away. A storyteller tells a tale of Sinbad with puppets, but later swaps the Star Wars using action figures as props. As Pablo said, Good artists borrow, but great artists steal. William was an American writer. He was so thin that if you looked at him sideways, he was invisible. He invented the terms heavy metal and blade runner and once shot his wife in the head while pretending to be William Tell. At night, he smokes Kiff and his typewriter morphs into a creature like a giant cockroach. Mint tea is like drinking a polo mint. Houses painted blue can give you some protection against gin, or else you can wear the hand of Fatima around your neck. I've tasted mint tea, but not smoked kiff. I have never been to Morocco, but I still wrote this. Okay. 
afterwards. Will you rend your clothes and put ash on your sleeve? Will you climb down the inverted ziggurat into the earth where I, where I hang like a peg and my sister's pigeon? Will you cover all the mirrors in creation and make the plant swear a solemn oath, even the mistletoe? Will you forgive me for ingesting a few measly pomegranate seeds? Will you look back before we reach the surface? Will you read all the books to me that were published after I left for the land of silence, not knowing if I can hear you? Will cafe owners tell their customers, that's his chair, that's where he wrote his income? comprehensible garbage, and he still owes me for seven black coffees. La Matadora, you followed that woman who dressed in armor, on her flag of fleur-de-lis. I am the bull to her, La Matadora. Sometimes the matador is me. Zeus carries off poor Europa. The Olympian's mind was on rape. I am the bull to her La Matadora. There's a sword concealed in her cape. You ask me who is speaking. Whose voice do you hear today? I am the bull to her La Matadora. I fall as the crowd cries, Ole. We learn the rhythm before the meaning. Dali's mustache. Magritte's pipe and Van Gogh's ear walk into a bar. The bartender exclaims, that's a bit surreal. A horse with a long face, drowning his sorrows in bourbon, knocks back his drink and leaves in disgust, muttering to himself, at least my story was funny. The reduction of art in the 21st century. Dali's moustache, Magritte's pipe and Van Gogh's ear walk into a bar the bartender says, you just missed them. Frida Kahlo's eyebrows were in here earlier, drinking mescal. Oh, my wife's just put a notice in front of me, says, talk to your audience. Don't just read poems. They don't care. Um, right. Now I've got to do the Frida Kahlo poem for the chance. Huh? One, six, four. Okay, uh, yeah, um, I love Frida Kahlo's work. I love Diego Rivera's work. The blue house is still there. The blue house. In the blue house, Frida Kahlo rises through sheets of silver fever, her body bathed in the platinum sweat of pneumonia. In the blue house, the left-handed hummingbird caresses her body at the zenith of the step pyramid of life. The sun drinks the crimson pulque of her blood and is intoxicated. Mexico will live another year and another. But she is already carried free by four jade green parrots away from the steel corset of time and space. Above the canopy of her bed sprawls Judas Iscariot, fireworks strapped to his limbs. He wears a mask of sugar. His heart is an icicle. In the blue house, her dress is a flag of hope. Her untamed hair spreads like a puddle of black water on the crisp pillow, revealing the votive hand hanging from the miracle of her ear. In the blue house, all is quiet except for the paintings on the walls, self-portraits whose honesty renders us clairvoyant. We read her every thought, for like the golem, life and death are written on her forehead. In the studio, pigments are no longer mixed as they are in the streets of Mexico City. A wheelchair faces the easel where Joseph Stalin stands unfinished. Fireworks strapped to his limbs, he wears a mask of sugar, his heart is an ice pick. In the blue house, like the white shadow of Christ, a deer leaps from the forest, its exquisite hide scarred by arrows and amputations that are nothing but unos cuentos picotitos for one who has been carried free by four jade green parrots. On the wall of the blue house, under the leaf dappled shadows, a plaque bears this inscription, 
Frida and Diego lived in this house, 1920, 1954. Is that it? Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please don't move, give a big round of applause to Bill Lewis, please. Thank you. Wow. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Right. Superb. So did, did um, I, I, have you got time since we've got a little bit of space whilst uh, the next on the list will be uh, next to read will be and I've lost it now. Um, superb. Leslie, if you want to prepare something. Bill, do you have one to give us as an encore that you can put your hand to? Yeah, come on. Yeah, encore. 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 encore, encore. 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 So Leslie, you'll be next, and then Julie after Leslie, if you want to prepare yourselves while we uh, enjoy some more of the great Bill Lewis. Um, and then after Julie will be Adam, Adam Horowitz. So you're on mute. Before you start, you're on mute, you're on mute. There you go. Lovely. I was scrambling to find the poem I was going to read you, but I've lost it. Don't mind, I'll do this instead. Oh, found it. Estragon and Vladimir have left the theater. Gordo finally got there, but Estragon and Vladimir were gone. Put another book upon the fire. I'm getting cold, I'm getting on. Gordo was always rather tardy. Estragon and Vladimir, mere existential Laurel and Hardy. Obvious meaning makes me mean. I find it just gets in the way. Estragon and Vladimir now wait far away while Godot is here to stay. Super, please unmute. Please unmute. One, one last round of applause to Bill. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed that. Superb. Okay, so unfortunately, Leslie, you have to follow that. I'm sure you have some lovely words for us though. Oh boy, wonderful, Bill. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is a poem I don't think I've ever read or rarely. Uh, it's about being a totally, a total jackass wedding guest, and maybe we've all been there, but uh uh yeah, I live I live in Mexico often, so this this was an event in, in Sayulita, Nayarit, Mexico, Mexico. It's called Salome, the wedding guest. I think too much, you say, always the John, I will give you my head on the platter. Stop asking. It is you who is Salome and not me, not me. I am not the bride. It is I, the upright John who feeds the mewing cats. I who feed them, excuse me, who sleep at my feet. And I who sit at theirs, eyes blinking in time to the inner twitch, the inner twitch, wise and silent and no one's fool as am I. I try to be presentable for the wedding as my mother would plead, please be presentable, but I'm not getting any sleep. It's not my fault, never my fault that I'm not presentable and often wear black to a wedding when I know better. I'm a devout Marcus, Marxist, I say. It's part of my religion to wear black to a wedding. I lie, I just want to wear black, it suits me. I play the waiting game with my hair, my crowning glory, I play the game, not combing, not combing, sleeping every night and not combing until the old guy in the plaza says to me in Spanish and he means it, what's up with your hair? He gets it, I like him. I twitch as I sleep in full daylight, but not at night, not at night, but dance. It is the wedding of the season and I dance and spin close to the bandstand, just out of reach as the fireworks boom overhead. Your arms grasping, groping, trying to catch me just out of reach. I evade you. It is my game this time, my private dream of spinning uncontrolled and giddy, belonging to no one but myself, like a cat. It is not the wine that I drink that I had too much of, but the nectar of love at the wedding. My crown, my scepter, my life contained and contained my inglorious crown like sparkling wine squeezing the hell out of my 
poor head. Already I have the afterburn headache of celebration while I am still here at the wedding. The perfect wedding guest who gets no cake even though there are 20. I'm told to travel. I'm told to flee, yet stay here. What if, what if, what if I float away like the wedding lanterns above the water at night? I float away south this time, south this time to make peace always with the dissonance, with the shadows, half light, half mast. I sing off key, even when I know better, half light, half mast. Give me the headache remedy. It is November. The wedding is past, and how I wish you all well. My second, uh, my second offering is um, pretty new. It's called How to Surrender. One, we await the ceremony, and all the while you there waiting. At the beginning, we pause. The beginning, not the end, for you are taken to start again. Two, filthy bath, what comes down on you shines. The light makes you light so you can tread water and all that's dark falls below never again to bother floating. You are clean again. You now above the dirt, the filthy bath. Three, how to surrender. How to surrender is you drop to the ground and roll. You can't have any more because I say so. You can't have it your way. You can't do it your way and you don't know what you want. Don't you know this? Don't you know that the jig is up? The jig is up, so be there with it. Dance a jig, pivot, turn, squirm. It's over and all you can do is nothing or laugh or cry or pitch a bitch and deny, deny that you can't have it your way. No one can. Move on, move forward. Say out loud this fear that held you tight in that embrace that it is not love or anything close to it. Say out loud this scream inside what it really is. Say what it really is, this scream. Is love backwards, sideways, upside down, subverted, perverted, but it is love. The slash and burn urge, this need to be and to be free is there. It is there. To do it, to be free, you have to do Say it, face it, pray it, be it, one foot in front of the other, moving, running fast, so fast you are airborne. Use your damned wings attached to the shoulders, release your arms from the duty, free them, let the wings do it, and soar. So that's it for me. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, please unmute. Big round of applause for Leslie, please. Super. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, great stuff. Pressure's on you now, Julie. I'm sure you got this. Over to you. I think I'm following um, the use of wings here. <laughs> um, as a disabled person, I'm often whizzing around on my scooter um, or the DIY version um, with two sticks. Now, if the weather is just the right temperature, then I have a bit of a sprint. Ha <laughs> ha. This is called Right on Walls. The spirit of sun lets me walk this way. No hurdles rise up for me on this path. Thoughts with torn edges won't scare today. To go forwards is a great win, I say. There are days that steal this wonderful prize. The spirit of sun lets me walk this way. Some gusts have grabbed urges to break away left fragments of worry in front of me. Thoughts with torn edges won't scare today. The smooth glide of steps has let my feet sway, gave courage to dance and chase this wild wave. The spirit of sun lets me walk this way. Last time I took daffodils from bouquets, gave them to people who searched for their smile. Thoughts with torn edges won't scare today. Keep hold of these moments and sing their worth. Write them on walls that cement you inside. Thoughts with torn edges won't scare today. The spirit of sun 
let me walk this way. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen in a heat wave, which we've had recently, but hey, never mind. It's cooled down again. And I'm going to do a quick finishing poem, which follows on quite nicely. It's called Circus Act. I can skate when these legs work, dare myself to somersault over your hedge, give life-changing news. You're happy now. Make clothes that shape me a billion years younger. Rub two sticks together, toast marshmallows. Let them spin and drop fire on my tongue. Extend the hours. You've got time now. Ride a bicycle. Sprint to swallow your deadline. I bake cakes. Pretend it's my birthday. Invite the town. Throw a javelin faster than that hurtling train. Believe it. Make a meal with one hand and the world can eat. Plan a trip to Jupiter and start selling tickets. When my legs don't work, I swallow glass. Thank you. Wow, what a powerful line to finish on as well. It's such a contrast to the rest of the poem. Superb, Julie. Please unmute and give Julie an excellent round of applause, please. Thank you. So over to you, Mr. Horowitz. Adam, um, please give us a couple, if you will. Well, what over I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, an extract from my father's book, uh, Midsummer Morning Jog Log, in honour of Bill, who, uh, who my father published. And, who I shared uh, grand, uh, pages with grand, and grandchildren of Albion with. And this is my father's Rural Rhapsody, 670 lines uh, about jogging through the, um, the Slad Valley in the 60s. This is kind of a long love letter to my mum. It's called Midsummer Morning Jog Log. And this is from part five. It's longish, but lo kind of it, it makes, up as, makes up to two poems. Earth's energy like fish from fish or iris dilating to iris like pollen keeps darting out and on and round, twirling sycamore keys to unlock, transform, outface the more and more closely binding, inexorable, mobile mosaic of intertwined death in life, life in death. Shedding leaves, spilling seeds, composting, hiving, declining, yet still reviving, piecing itself together with all, with all its crawling and fluttering denizens, tunneling and buzzing, sawing and subtly trumpeting on in muted solos or dizzy glissandi, or discanting, or glistering within the lights and darks of other wafting winds and reeds and woods, Dead elm and evergreen, broken bluebell, trampoline of runner bean and columbine, arcing and curling where the brook pearls through a clearing. Heatherbell and harebell mount with bugles, pell-mell, flickering and flaring, and jamming blues with buskers, and small groups burgeoning, soon to grow to big bands, orchestras with massed bluebells standing, hunched or cupping upward, in unison with pan and god, and Mother Nature, hymning high summer's heyday of cockerel paging Pimpernel, and Asphodel and Morris men, with ne'er-do-well and infidel made completely good again by falling down a wishing well. Maids and farmhands come away to chase and play the rites of Flora's holiday. Her children romp intrepidly on dry stone walls right merrily, and all the while the roundelays of songbirds pump the revelry of spinneys, dells and gardens, embroidered, embroidered in herbaceous jamboree, with soapwort and stitchwort, ladies' bedstraw, sneezewort, musk, mallow, milkwort, nipplewort and navelwort. Vexed gardeners, though, chase litterbugs across bones and plastic glasswort, and as they slither on the dregs of bottle, bottle savage ragwort, they mutter darkly how they wish such spirits never blithe wort. Yet worms writhe on and thrive from non-stop bibbing of clean earth dirt, spent bladderwort just one more twist to their pattern of all patience. 
Yes, the cut worm forgives the plow as firewood, the chainsaw, in the, in the pattern ever changing, constant, using, used by everything that lives. Matching, cross hatching, intro and extrovert, pervert with convert, Ginsburg to George Herbert, Coleridge spooning dropwort, whilst Dorothy and William take his hemp nettle sherbet with a sharp pinch of saltwort. And their inward eyes flash outward, questing local habitations for the airy shapes and rills that haunt our ancient lakes and hills. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, Adam. Please uh, unmute and give Adam a big round of applause. My wife just said she could hear Michael reading that. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Super. I mean, that I was such... a lot of time imitating him, Bill. <laughs> uh, that such oh it's so rich and so musical and it's a real treat adam for you to read it for us um all without a kazoo um but still the blake shines through anglo saxophone um, anglo yeah I, I, wish I, could, I wish i could play the anglo saxophone I can't. <laughs> Um, and of course, the other thing is that um, the, the book is uh, that art connection that we started with when we talked about Bill at the start. Um, that that book that you're you're reading from is uh, illustrated by Peter Blake, no less. Um, yes, so yes, in his rural days and his very very kind of uh, re really beautiful kind of like cross hatched ruralist phase. It's, it's a beautiful book, a beautiful Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Um, uh, Adam, did you just want to quickly mention the celebration you've got coming up in Cheltenham um, about your father and, and Francis as well? Well, yeah, it's sold out. In fact, uh, there's no tickets left, apparently. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, but at uh, Cheltenham Poetry Festival, I'm doing a show called Remembrances, which I'm going to I'm hoping to do elsewhere with an, ac an actress reading my mother's work and me uh, and kind of basically bringing poetry of my parents and my own kind of from and about the time we spent in the Slab Valley in the 70s. Mm. So it's kind of a mix of Michael's uh, more kind of rural rhapsodic phase and um, my mother's quieter uh, poetry and my own, which is kind of, it takes elements from both of them. So. Yeah. Brilliant. Superb. I, I'm very pleased to have got one of those tickets and I look forward to, to coming along to that. Um, but yes, uh, the, the uh, as Adam said, the connection with Gloucester Poetry Society is that the Slad Valley is in Gloucestershire. So we are very, very lucky to have such a rich heritage of uh, literary connections. Uh, and of course, Laurie Lee as well in the same valley, no less, uh, as well as the yeah. Dimmock Poets. Anyway, um, that's it. Um, I haven't missed anyone, have I? I think, no, that's it. Thank you very much for attending. Please join us again on Wednesday, the 5th of October. Everyone's welcome back. Um, uh, whether you're here just for tonight, um, uh, um, uh, everyone can always pop along, no matter where you are. We love your poetry and love your company. Thank you very, very much. And a very good night to you, you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.